Welcome to video two for week eight. For parametric curves, the calculus of parametric curves is really controlled by the tangent vector. The tangent vector tells us what direction we're going and the length of it tells us how fast we're going along a curve. And all of the other things that we've calculated for the calculus of parametric curves, like arc length, like curvature, like torsion, they are all based on calculations involving that tangent vector. For a surface, we don't have a single tangent vector. A surface is a two-dimensional object, so it doesn't have a single tangent vector. It has a whole tangent plane, like the graphs we talked about in Calculus 3, a scalar field. Working in R3, and I want to work exclusively in R3 here, a tangent plane is determined by the normal to that tangent. So what I want to do is I want to try and define the normal to a parametric surface. And that normal is going to control the calculus of the parametric surface exactly the same way that the tangent controlled the calculus of a parametric curve. So here's the setup. Say that I have a parametric curve, again going into R3, defined on some simply connected domain D. We call the curve C1, or in class C1, if all of its partial derivatives exist and are continuous. That's going to be enough for our purposes. Most of our curves are, in fact, going to be C infinity, which is infinitely differentiable. These are often called smooth, and that's a word I might use later. I don't really actually need that full condition of infinitely differentiable. I only need one derivative to happen. But again, for most of the examples, we're actually going to use uh, one derivative, and infinitely many derivatives are going to be the same thing. But let me go on. A, a surface is C1 if its partial derivatives exist and are continuous. So let's say we have a C1 surface. I can take the partial derivative in U and the partial derivative in V of the three components of the surface and get three vectors. And these are sort of like the tangent vector in the U direction and the tangent vector in the Y in the V direction based on the two parameters. With two parameters, you can think of two independent directions of movement along the surface. I can sort of move in the u direction, and I can move in the v direction. And each of those directions of movement gives me a tangent vector. And these two tangent vectors will, in fact, span the tangent plane of the parametric surface. So their cross product should be the normal. And that is, in fact, exactly the case. The cross product of these two is the normal. Now, you may remember the cross product is anti-commutative. The cross product can point above or can point below. And that just basically depends on the order of the variables, whether you order them uv or whether you order them vu. So whenever I'm talking about normals, normals can be above or below a surface, and it's based on the convention of how I ordered the variables. That's not too tricky, it's just something to keep in mind. So this is the normal of the surface with the ordering of variables u and v. And this is the thing that's really going to determine the calculus of parametric surfaces. Everything we're going to do is going to be based on calculations using this normal vector. In particular, the surface is non-singular if its normal is never zero. And we want this to be the case at least almost everywhere. For a parametric curve, we wanted the tangent to be non-zero, so we don't have parametric curves that stop. If they stop and just sort of sit at a point for a whole period of time, that messes with a lot of our definitions. We would like parametric curves to be curves that sort of keep going. So we wanted them to have non-zero tangents. Here we want it to have non-zero normals, so that it has a well-defined tangent plane. All right, let me do some examples of calculating normals. So here is the graph of a scalar field, first example from the previous video. I take the partial derivatives here. So the partial derivative of u is 1, partial derivative in u of v is 0, and then this is the partial derivative of whatever the function is, likewise for v. And if I take the cross product of those two things, I get negative of the partial of f in u, negative of the partial of f in v, and 1. And you may remember that this is precisely the normal to the tangent plane of the graph of a scalar field that we did in calculus 3. Or at least, if not precisely, it's the same up to a, a multiplication of negative 1, because we can change how we order these variables. The normal can point above or below. And that's good. We recognize that we get for the parametric surface, the same normal that we had previously just looking at the graph of a scalar field. I can do the same thing for a surface revolution. So here's the parametric description of the surface revolution of a function of one variable around the x-axis. 
I can always change the axis if I want and I have to adjust the variables. But here it's around the x-axis. I take the partials in x, so the partial of x, in, of x is one, this f becomes an f prime. I can take the partials in theta, partial in theta of x is zero, there's no theta there. Cos becomes negative sine, sine becomes cos. And then I can take the dot product, or the cross product rather, of these two things to get the normal, which is this somewhat complicated expression. But I do want to notice that this has uh, a, a, an x coordinate that depends on the original function, and then has the same circular symmetry for the y and z coordinates, which makes sense because we expect this object with circular symmetry to have normals that also have circular symmetry pointing out from the object perpendicular to it at every point. Let me calculate the normal of the sphere in parametric description. So here's the parametric description of the sphere. I take the derivative in theta, so cos becomes negative sine, sine becomes cos. This doesn't depend on theta at all. I take the derivative in phi, sine becomes cos, sine becomes cos, cos becomes negative sine. I take the cross product of these two things, I get this. And I can actually factor negative r sine phi out of this and what I have left here is, in fact, exactly the same thing I started with. And that hopefully makes a little bit of sense, because the normal to a sphere, if I have a point on a sphere, the normal should point directly out from that point. And that's, in fact, a multiple of the same vector that got me to that point. So here's the vector that gets me to that point, and then the local direction of the normal that points out from that point should be some multiple of exactly the same vector. If I have a point down here, I have a vector that points out here, and I have the normal that points out in the same direction. A sphere centered at the origin, this sphere is indeed centered at the origin, should have this behavior for its normals. Its normals should always be a multiple as a local direction of the vector as a position vector of the point I'm at. Here's the parametric description of the cylinder. I take the partial in theta, so cos becomes negative sine, sine becomes cos. There's no theta in z. I take the partial in z. There's no z's in the first two components. So I just get 0, 0, 1. Take the cross product, and I get something that has circular symmetry and no z component. And again, that should hopefully make sense. If I have a cylinder around the z-axis, its normals should point out from this, and they should have no z component. They don't point up or point down. They just point out. I could do it for the cone as well. I'm not going to sort of go through all of these things. I take the partial in theta, the partial in z, take the cross product, get this somewhat complicated situation ending up. But it does, in fact, have a z component, which is good because for the cone, the normal, depending whether it points out or points in, should have a positive or negative z component for the cone. Unlike the cylinder, for the cylinder, I just had something that pointed straight out. For the cone to be perpendicular, it has to point in some positive or negative z direction. 